In a fractal conception, I am a cell-sized unit of the human organism, and I have to use my life to leverage a shift in the system by how I am as much as with the things I do. This means actually being in my life, and it means bringing my values into my daily decision-making. Each day should be lived on purpose. Adrian Marie Brown, Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds. Our radical imagination is a tool for decolonization, for reclaiming our right to shape our lived reality. Another beautiful quote by Adrienne Marie Brown, pleasure activism, the politics of feeling good. And I'm feeling good this morning. Welcome to the Regeneration Nation podcast hosted by Transition US, a place where we aim to nurture a network ecosystem of regenerative communities, actively sharing and co-creating the inspiration, the messages, models, and support needed to reimagine and rebuild our world. Hi, I'm Jess Alvarez Parfrey. And I'm Elvia Cruz Garcia. And today we're excited to be joined by Ruben Elias Cañedo. Ruben, a warm and much anticipated welcome to you today. In typical TUS style, we wanted to open up the space with some check-ins and intros, letting us know what you're bringing into the virtual circle today. Also 100% an invitation to reflect on those words of wisdom from Adrienne Marie Brown we shared in the opening. Over to you, Elvia. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Elvia Cruz Garcia. She, her, her pronouns. And I'm super happy that you're all listening today to our new episode of our podcast, Regeneration Nation. I guess I'll give a little introduction to myself. Um, I would say that before college, I was I was very sheltered. And so when I got to college and learned about the climate crisis and climate injustices and I was just very shocked and just, you know, like very heartbroken to just like realize like this has all been happening. And it really instilled something in me to like want to <clears throat> find something to do or like try to do something. And that's when I started reaching out to community members and I started organizing with making the venture possible for all students. And we basically um, took a lot of students of color and low income to the outdoors and like provided outdoor trips like camping, hiking and all like free and low cost. And that was a really great experience. And from there on, I also like started working with Environmental Justice Alliance on our student campus and EcoVista, which is actually a transition initiative. So I think I've definitely had a really great experience and I'm really, really grateful to also be working within Transition US as the communications and outreach lead. But that's a little introduction to who I am and if Ruben, if you wanna share, you know, an introduction. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all so much for the invitation. Super grateful to be here. And it's always a pleasure to share space with other folks who are in community reading and moving with AMB, you know, shout out to AMB. Um, it was, it's been awesome to just be in journey uh, with them in the emergent strategy community. Uh, my name is Ruben. I use he, they pronouns. I am a uh, born and raised uh, troublemaker. Uh, I feel like I was born into a family of, of, of folks who were actively asking questions about why is the world the way that it is and how do we take better care of ourselves and our communities um, in that process and always, always being asked, uh, how are you going to leave this place better? Uh, I think that was, if there's a question that both of my parents have asked me the most, it's probably that question. Um, what are you doing so that you can contribute in better ways? How are you leaving the places, uh, relationships that you are a part of better than when you first arrived? So that journey has has led me to pursue higher education in the United States. I'm, I'm a first generation college student. Uh, my parents went to college in Mexico, uh, but I'm the first one um, in the US that, that pursued higher education, public higher education. I'm a public higher education kid uh, from fourth grade on. I think I was in private school when, when we were in Mexicali, when I lived in Mexico, because I'm a border kid. Um, but it's it's different. The private public dynamic in Mexico is very different than the public private dynamic um, in the U.S. Quite frankly, I, I got kicked out of school when I was in Mexico. 
I was a little bit too, too uh, vocal and I would finish my work and I would start talking to my friends and the teachers got fed up and kicked me out of the school. That's the long story short version. So they had to send me to another school and my parents had to pay a little bit to be there. Um, but yeah, super great for it to be here. And I think we're going to get into a whole bunch of conversations today where we're going to be able to, to play with different things. So I'm excited to be here with y'all. I am, I'm just overjoyed uh, to be sharing space with you both and to be in community and conversation. Um, a little bit about me, I'm a mom. I'm living up here on uh, Central Pomo territory in Northern California on the Mendocino coast. I'm also currently serving as the executive director for Transition US. And I feel like, like you Ruben, I come from like a long line of troublemakers and people who like to think outside the box. I remember some of my earliest memories. Um, I was born in Chula Vista. Also, you know, this, this memory of going across the border and being with family and then coming back over and being with family. So this belief that, you know, we could all belong to each other, we could all be connected, um, was an important part of kind of my growing awareness of the world and my place in it. And I also had a deep love for animals and the natural world and, and grew up with my, my father. Um, being a non-traditional student. So he went to UC San Diego. I would go to some of his biochem classes with him. Um, I remember going to the local food co-op and just that experience of being in that, in that space where food was like sacred, you know, and like f feeling that same feeling when I would be at my grandmother's house and that food was sacred. Um, and I remember one of my favorite things was looking at the bulletin board where people would post like, hey, I got this. Do you need this? Who wants to meet up here for music or a jam session? Like just feeling so enamored with that part of humanity and really seeing that take place on these college campuses. So fast forward, you know, I, I've worked with Greenpeace. Um, I actually met my partner there and um, eventually came um, back up timelines man like time is not <laughs> time is not linear i'm just like going off like feeling this um deep sense of connection to our subject matter today um but my point being like it's such a it's such a gift to be able to connect um and really recognize the wealth that we have in our relationships so ruben i met you when i was a student at uc santa barbara that's where i met you alvia and uh i, I remember being part of the uc global food initiative and I remember what I knew about you is like Ruben was such a good campus organizer that they, they offered him a job or something like that. Like knowing that you were really effective at mobilizing folks and uh, and really bringing to the fore like how important it was for us to take a look at basic needs um, and really addressing injustices at the university level. So anyway, I'm really excited to be here. I'm sure we'll get into more about ourselves, um, but I wanted to to send it over to you, Elvia, to kind of open us up with the, the first question. Yes, welcome Ruben to the podcast. And before we get started with some questions, I wanted to read your bio. So Ruben was born and raised in the border valleys of Mexicali, Imperial, and Coachella. Ruben is a recipient of UC Regents and Chancellor's Full Scholarship and first-generation alumnus of UC Berkeley. Ruben's academic coursework and publications focus on public higher education, equity, intersectionality, and systems change. Ruben serves as director of equity initiatives within UC Berkeley's Division of Equity and Inclusion. His responsibilities include college student basic needs, strategic planning, and mobilization. Ruben was appointed to the dual roles of chair of the UC Berkeley Basic Needs Committee and co-chair of the UC System-wide Basic Needs Committee. This effort focuses on research, prevention, sustainability, and advocacy. His efforts have published studies on college student food insecurity and homelessness in higher education and have helped inform both state and federal policies. Additionally, Ruben facilitates keynotes and trainings on healing, life journey, and maximizing performance. Ruben is a third degree black belt in traditional karate and helps coach his father national team. Welcome Ruben. And our first question is, what is your origin story? How did you come to this work? 
What is my origin story? Mm. But you are a superhero. And also you can answer that question. <laughs> what would your, your outfit look like? What's your name? <laughs> oh my goodness. That's, that's such a great question. I love that. Um, I think, uh, yeah, for me is, is a little bit of what I shared before. It's, <clears throat> it's important to contextualize just the, the family that I come from. Um, I was incredibly privileged and so, so fortunate that uh, I come from a two parent household with the full spectrum of, of that from, from the most harmful, challenging sides of it, all the way, all the way to the most healthiest and loving and glowing aspects of it, because life is balance. You know, I'm a, I'm a huge star Wars person. Uh, I'm a huge, like a, what do you call ghetto nerd? If you will, I don't know if y'all have had a chance to read, uh, the brief and wondrous life of Oscar Wilde. Uh, but that's one of the books that that really shaped me uh, reading about a uh, story of a, of a kid that grows up in the ghetto and the projects uh, that is um, fat, not athletically gifted. And his world is like comic books and stories and imagination and being surrounded by these powerful women. Like I, I really resonate with that story because because that was me. I, I grew up in a really powerful feminist family where from the point that I, I I have recollection our nana uh our our grandma from my father's side has always been kind of like the 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 model of a leader of an entrepreneur of a of an advocate for our communities who had a really difficult life but always found a way to work and sell tamales out of her car and buy a little restaurant and then that little restaurant was uh, doing really well and got involved feeding um, Cesar Chavez and the um, farm workers movement when they were in the Coachella Valley. And that allowed her to, to make enough money to buy herself a larger restaurant. And, and then eventually the restaurant burns down and depression, a lot of things came up that impacted the generations, not just hers, but the future ones. So, um, you know, that's that's one lineage. And then on the other side, my parents really fortunate that although they're both from Chihuahua, Mexico, my dad's side of the family came over to the U.S. through the Bracero program and went through like Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, ultimately in the Coachella Valley. But they grew up in Mexico, right? They, it was the U.S. schooling system, culture, environments, development, whereas my mom is also from Chihuahua. She's an indigenous Aramuri. Uh, mujer were Raramuri people uh, from the Copper Canyons, and she did all of her schooling in Mexico and found herself as a first generation college student going to UNAM in Mexico City, which for folks that don't know UNAM, UNAM is like the UC Berkeley of Latin America, right? This like massive research one institution that is that is highly revered around the world. So you have this little indigenous, well, not little because my mom was actually pretty tall, but you have this tall indigenous mujer from Chihuahua that goes to Mexico City and she wasn't prepared for the culture shock. I mean, coming from coming from the coming from the mountains to the city to at that point, the largest city in the world, you can just imagine the cultural differences in that experience. And then you add the academic rigor of going to a research one institution. Um, so I'm really, I'm really intentional about naming all of those complexities because I always knew the spectrum of life. I knew that we couldn't romanticize life. I knew that when we're being successful, there's going to be challenges. And when you think you're doing all of the right thing, life is going to show you some different things that happens that even when you're doing all of the right things, case in point, my grandma working her butt off, but her restaurant burning down and she never recuperated from that. She never opened up a restaurant again. Another example is, is my dad going through schooling, going through law school in his final year, realizing how corrupt the legal system in Mexico was dropping out of law school and becoming a full time martial artist. And to this day, my dad has the majority of the records in Mexico for karate. And then my mom doing all of the schooling, getting her degrees, being a working professional, being married, having myself and applying for for her residency to go into the side of citizenship to come into the U.S. And and it took 26 years for my mom to become a U.S. citizen. Right. It was beyond my my lifetime. So you can be doing all the right things 
And because we're operating in unjust systems and unjust institutions, doing all of the right things actually doesn't produce the outcomes of belonging, equity, and justice, right? For our community specifically. So because of those experiences, I was raised to be very critical of the way that the world was and at the same time very imaginative because I was uh, I, I was born uh, with a disability. I'm breathing compromised. I had severe allergies. And as you all speak, environmental injustices, you know, being in Mexico City, with, which was the most polluted city in the world at that time, and then coming to Mexicali, uh, the Mexicali Valley and the Imperial Valley, which is heavy agricultural, all the pesticides that were at that time not controlled at all, made my experience always impacted by the environment that I was in. I mean, I was sick most of my childhood. I was medicated most of my childhood. It made my system very weak. So I would easily um, injure myself, get fractures. Um, and I was always in some kind of like medical procedures. So the world not being accessible to me, the world shaping me through my disability experiences was incredibly formative for me to ask myself, where can I go that people are going to believe that a better world isn't just uh, necessary, right? It's like inevitable. The only way that we survive is by shaping a healthier and better world where everyone can have their basic needs met, where everyone has the resources to self-actualize so that they can contribute in meaningful ways. So one conversation at a time through those experiences is how I got here today. Wow. And Ruben, like, it's, it's amazing how many elements of that story like I can resonate with like my my father was a ghetto nerd like he would play Dungeons and Dragons and he was also a martial artist um, and he grew up uh, being a chubbier kid I remember him sharing that he was made fun of um, he had a lisp so like you know martial arts was a really important part of his life it was an, also an important way of bringing forward different ways of seeing the world and our place in it like um, kind of Eastern philosophies. Um, I remember the yin yang symbol being a really important, uh, almost like a sacred space in our house, my dad having that kind of hanging up. Um, but I, I want to go on to this next question. Tell us a bit about the UC system. What most captures your imagination and your investment in public, plug, public education? Yeah, great question. So um, the UC system is made up by 10 universities, public research one universities in, in the state of California. And it was envisioned as part of the California Master Plan for Higher Ed, which called for higher education to be accessible to all people at all times by way of a three system design, a community college that was going to be hyper localized and anyone at any point should be able to have an accessible uh, education for them to genuinely develop in whatever ways they wanted to, right? You don't have to go to community college just to get a degree. There are things there that allow you to develop skills that are just going to make your quality of life better. Like if you're an artist, go, go learn some skills in photography, paint, acting, whatever. Um, if you just want to get some culinary development, go take some culinary courses in your local community college. Everything is available for us at any point in time. You and I at any point in time can go to a community college. And if we're eligible for financial aid, it can help us. And if not, you can still pay your like whatever amount of the depending on the course that you're taking. Right. It can range from very affordable to very expensive, mostly driven by the equipment that you would need for the course. But that was the purpose of community college, that folks felt that at any point in time, should you be curious about something or want to develop skills as about in any area, you can go to your community college. And then there is, if you want to go beyond just an entry level or specialized skill set, and you're more curious about a more advanced degree at a four-year level, then the state school is there for folks that are going to essentially join the workforce and not and, and be from entry level to middle management and over an extended period of times can eventually get into that executive leadership position, right? And lead uh, different sectors of the world, right? Like beautiful in that way. 
And then the research university was for folks that were more curious about why are things the way that they are and can we make them better? So that the folks that are working in the sectors have the latest research and patents and ways so that they can improve the work that they're doing. When you just look at it, it's a very beautiful and powerful design that doesn't put a hierarchy of human value of like you're more worthy if you go to one than the other. It's the reality that the human experience needs to have different skill sets and expertise to be able to take care of self and sustain towards a better world. That's the California master plan. Let's make sure that everybody at all times has access depending on what your capacities and curiosities are. Unfortunately, because we operate in capitalism and white supremacy and patriarchy and ableism, the imagination of those have shaped public higher education in a way that has to be responsive to survive in those conditions. So as less resources have been made available, the universities have become more and more expensive and politics get involved to the extent that California uh, in our lifetimes has built more prisons than colleges and so on and so forth, right? So I just wanna put the context for folks and like what, what we're operating in that puts pressure on that. Luckily, our generation is living a massive cultural change in public higher education because the previous civil rights movements and social justice movements that called for students from all communities to have access to these institutions are now becoming the middle managers, managers and leaders of those institutions. They've paid their dues and they've worked in the field for the last two to three decades that now you're starting to see more women, more first generation, more LGBT plus, more uh, minoritized, if you will, or like uh, BIPOC, folks of color in those positions, more immigrants, more folks that come from low income, working class backgrounds that are now becoming those leaders. So they're bringing a different experience and a different imagination to that, right? They're saying, hey, when I went to college, people didn't take care of me. So we gotta take care of people. Or it was so hard for me to have multiple jobs and be able to afford going to college and when I went to college, the rent was so much more affordable, right? Like we, we were just with a, with a community member yesterday, a potential donor, and she was sharing with us how difficult it was for her to experience college. She was very proud that she completed and that she can't imagine how college is today because when she went to college, her rent was $80 a month, eight zero, right? Her rent was $80 a month. The rent today, depending on which UC campus you're in, but for a single room, you're talking about anywhere between $1,800 to $2,500 just for rent, right? So the things have changed in that way. So that's, that's where the UC system operates. The other thing that I wanna share about the UC system is that because it's such a globally recognized system, meaning when you travel around the world, a significant portion of the global uh, workforce at a, at a research or executive expertise level has largely been educated through UC. So it's known around the world. It is shaping the world. That is why it's so important that we actively prioritize making the UC better because whatever you do in the UC shapes the entire landscape of higher ed, not just in California and the United States, but truly around the world, right? Like People are visiting the websites, copying and pasting the content saying, well, what's going on in Berkeley or LA or Riverside or Merced or Irvine or Santa Barbara or San Diego or Davis or San Francisco so that they can learn from that and replicate it and try to make it better. So everything that we're doing, although it may appear as a local dynamic, the local is always shaping and informing the state, national and global. That's why to me as an active political decision, to prioritize improving and leaving the UC better because doing that impacts the landscape that it represents. I have a, a follow-up question. Um, so in the next 10 years, in your most radical imagination, what would be your hopes for these kind of systemic shifts within the UC? 
That's such a great question. Uh, so the first thing that comes to mind is um, I'm really looking forward changing the, the, the culture of success in, in the UC and public higher education. The metrics of success right now are about access, affordability, retention, persistence, performance, and completion, right? That's what we're doing. We want to make sure that these universities are accessible for the for the students that they are that that we want to matriculate and graduate and go on to shape the world with our degrees. We want it to be affordable so that it's not just the wealthier students that are going to it. We want to retain the students to keep them from dropping out. I don't know if y'all know, but sadly, the national completion rate for higher education is about 50 percent. Only 50 percent of people that start college across the country actually complete which if you think about 50% of people that start college leave without a degree and with debt, it's a double negative. You don't have a degree and you, and you owe for whatever amount of time you were in higher education. It's terrible, y'all. It's absolutely terrible. So that's why retention. Persistence is making sure that we're doing everything possible so that the student goes from year to year in a way that is intentional and then performance is that they're performing to the best of their abilities. And then completion is that they graduate. That's the metric of success. Nowhere in there do you hear health. Nowhere in there do you hear well being. That is not a metric of success. We don't measure the success of students saying, what is a health assessment or needs assessment at the beginning of your higher education career? And then when you graduate doing an exit assessment to see if we actually made you a healthier human being, or did we just cause more trauma, more stress, more anxiety, more self-harm ideation, and in the most extreme cases, suicidal ideation. We don't measure for that in an intentional way where depending on the outcomes of that, people are held accountable, chancellors, vice chancellors, executive directors, faculty, right, et cetera, et cetera. Imagine if we measured faculty by the, by the holistic impact that they had in their students, meaning if your students graduate from your course or complete your course, but they left more stressed with more anxiety and left unhealthier, then you failed as a faculty member. What's the point of you teaching them knowledge, but harming the somatic experience of that person? It makes no sense, right? We're not there, but that's where I want to get us to. That's the, that's the transformative justice piece of the work that we're doing. The way that we are doing that is by facilitating conversations around basic needs. Can we start by asking, do the students have the resources that they need to meet their essential basic needs, right? Housing food, health, child care or dependent care, technology, because now if you don't have technology, you can't navigate the college experience in this current generation, and then transportation, right? The reality is right now, and you all know this, but for the folks that are listening, I can be a student at, let's say UC Berkeley, because that's my, that's my home campus, but let's say that Jessica and I are in the same class. But Jessica is a legacy student of Berkeley, meaning that her parents and, and her parents' parents and their parents' parents all went to Berkeley. And they are wealthy to the point that they have zero financial aid and don't have difficulties paying for the tuition of going to UC Berkeley. They have housing, they have food, they have all their basic needs met. And most likely they probably are affording a tutor or additional support that is helping them make sure that they're getting the best of grades and advocating on their behalf. So by the time that they graduate, they have the best grades to transition into most likely a job that she's gonna get hooked up by a family member, right? Or from a network within their family. That same student is sitting next to me. And I'm a first generation college student with an undocumented mom, with a father who works in Mexico and the US, we lose a lot of money when the conversion of pesos into dollars. I have to work multiple jobs. I have to go to tutoring, free services, whenever I can, I can fit them in because I'm working so much. And I'm just trying to survive the day. To be honest, I'm in perpetual survival mode. 
both of those students are sitting side by side in the same classroom, expected to perform in the same ways and having to complete the same curriculum to get the same degree that does not mean the same things. And one is living with substantial debt and the other one is not. By design, this equation is broken. So for us is making sure that we're intervening that by rehumanizing higher ed, by saying, look y'all, to make this place even equitable, we need to make sure that everybody's basic needs are met. And once we meet everyone's basic needs and as we're doing that effort, let's also make sure that the academic experience is one where people can be healthy and successful. So that's what we got going on right now and bringing a lot of joy into it, bringing a lot of possibilities, bringing a lot of pleasure. Cause, oh my God, y'all, I don't know why we make higher ed like a void of joy and pleasure, right? And like, that's what Bell talks a lot in like teaching to transgress. Like we disconnect the somatic experience from schooling and education and joy and pleasure are seen as the antithesis of the, of the credibility of education, which makes no sense because we know how essential joy and pleasure in the somatic health and well-being are to our human experience. And we're all humans before we are whatever role we are in. No matter what role you are in, there's a human soma that needs to be healthy to fulfill all of those roles. So it's exciting times. We make a shit ton of trouble in the most joyful and pleasurable ways. That is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing so much knowledge and insight. I definitely have been learning a lot. My next question is, what advice would you give to youths in high school, community college, and university that are organizing for a better role, given your knowledge that you have now? Let me, let me answer each one of those. So in high school, I really wish that in high school, I would have had a, I would have had someone say that the world that I was visioning that most of the people around me was telling me was so impossible or that I was being too optimistic or that I was being too unrealistic was actually real. And that there were so many of us out there in the world that were in that frequency and moving in that direction, right? Like, that's why I love ethnic studies. I mean, when, when I finally got into college and I was able to read ethnic studies books and articles and oral stories, I was like, God damn, yo, like it's been generations of people that have been dreaming, meditating, creating art and culture of, of these worlds. I mean, we're talking about thousands and thousands of years of those kinds of prayers and visions and art and culture and magic of people always knowing that there's a way that we can be living that centers uh, love, that centers justice, that centers possibilities. And, and I, if I would have received that in high school, I would have not felt so alone. I wouldn't have felt so judged. I wouldn't have questioned myself so much at key times. Cause you know, when you're in high school, it's a different vibe, yo. Like you're just trying to fit in. You're trying to figure out how, how can I have the most peace in my experience? Because puberty is going on, hormones are going on. Like people are all over the place. Friends that you taught were gonna be one thing end up being another. You thought you were gonna be one thing happens in another. And it's hard for you to stay focused. And to know that through all that change that is happening, that your direction is not just possible, but it's also necessary. So I would have that kind of a conversation is to say, what's at the root of the journey for you? For me, it was really simple, y'all. I wanted my family to be safe. My mom was undocumented. My dad was a resident. We were a mixed status family and we were in the border. So there was border patrol around us every single day every single day. Safety was incredibly important for me. Whatever I got to do to finally make my family safe and in that journey contribute to everyone else feeling more safe, that's what I want to do. And I knew that I wasn't going to be able to do that if I just stayed in my very small border town of Calexico. 
The second thing was we grew up incredibly housing insecure. Every single year of my life, I lived in at least one place. Some years, two to three. So I just wanted to have some kind of housing stability that I was going to earn enough resources to make sure that our family was stable, safety and stability, because we didn't have that growing up, right? It was always fascinating. And shout out to my dad. I don't know how many of y'all have watched the, the movie, uh, A Beautiful Life, um, but it's about, you know, a father and a son and, and the father turns the, the Holocaust into a game into an adventure for his little boy so that he can survive an encampment. That was our dad. My dad made us believe that it was amazing to move every year and that every house was full of like dreams and possibilities and like all of these challenges that we were having. He, he turned it into such a romantic experience. Right. And then the third one was I need to make sure that my younger sister is going to have a better journey than I did so that she could pursue whatever it is that she wanted to pursue, whether it was college or something else. And then the last one is like, I always told myself, man, someday I want to be a phenomenal husband and I want to be a phenomenal father. And I know in order to do that, I need to work on myself and I need to have relationships and a career and organizing spaces that will facilitate for me to provide my life partner and provide our future kids, however many we're going to have or however little we're going to have. Uh, the best quality of life. It was that simple for me. I know it sounds hella basic, y'all, but I wasn't into like the flash and las modas and like what was in and all that kind of stuff. I mm, I was wearing hand-me-down clothes and whatever the fuck I got in my hand. I could care less about all of those things. My focus was like safety, stability, sister, future family. And whatever I need to do to move in that direction, I, I, I would do. And along that way, people were giving me books and telling me, hey, you need to learn about Zapatismo and you need to learn about like the civil rights movement and you need to learn about this and you need to learn about that. And that that is how I was able to make my move. So I would want to have that kind of a conversation with high school students to center them in that way, because, oh, my God, y'all, can you imagine being in high school right now? You have Instagram, TikTok, like uh, what's it? What Discord? You have nonstop social media and pressures where like it, you, you don't have to just worry about music, TVs, and like movies. They have the entire world coming at them every single day, nonstop. That's a lot. So how do we deescalate the high school experience and keep them as healthy as possible? And then for college, man, it's super simple for college. There's two things. Number one, prioritize your healing. If you're not in therapy right now, if you're not in counseling right now, if you're not in some kind of healing practice, I need you to do that ASAP. You need to leave your college experience already being in right relationship with your traumas and healing as much as possible. This is the time to do that. Yes, it is just as, if not more important than your actual degree. I know that's super, like, uh, what's it called? Like controversial, but sit me anybody in front of me and let's have that conversation. And, I'll, and I'm open to being proven wrong on that, but we gotta be graduating college students with more healing and less trauma because then they can go into their communities and bring that. And then the second thing is, I really wanna make sure that our, our, our college students are able to make meaningful relationships with folks across generations. They need to have meaningful relationships with folks who are on the other side of retirement and learn about those stories. Folks who are in the advanced stage of their work and learn about those experiences. Middle career folks, their peers and younger folks because the college age and like young professional is the bridge across all generations in every generation, in every generation. You are able to have the presence and the value of listening to elders as much as the joy and presence of listening to the youth. And keeping generations connected is how we thrive. A lot of the problems in the world right now is because we're so disconnected across generations. So many threads I want to pick up there. Um, my question for you is what inspires you? And I want, to, I want to pay particular attention or start off with science fiction. You mentioned being a ghetto nerd. And I, my second question is, if you were to imagine an altar 
with those that have inspired you, the ancestors, guides in this work, who would be on your altar? Yeah, what inspires me? Um, the first thing that comes to mind, y'all, that I'm starting to be more vocal of is, is to really um, lift it that I grew up as a disabled kid and it took a lot of people to take care of me. Uh, there were multiple times throughout my childhood that I, I didn't think I was going to make it past my childhood. I don't know if you all have ever experienced an asthma attack uh, or, or an anxiety attack or something that, that you literally lost your sense and ability to breathe. That was my normal consistently through my childhood. And when you black out, you're like, man, I hope I wake up in a little bit. <laughs> but if I don't, you know, it, it's been a good life type of thing. So I always start with my inspiration is that I was privileged to have a disabled childhood that affirmed to me how much love and care there is in the world. I can't, I don't have the story. I cannot say that no one ever cared about me. I know that there are folks who have that story. And maybe that's why I exist to keep ourselves balanced because they keep me accountable that not everybody had what I had, even as a disabled child. And I also let them know that as a disabled child that had no business being cared by anybody, because it's like, ah, you know, just let them, just let them go. There's healthier children there to stay focused on. People consistently cared for me, right? My parents cared for me. Our family cared for me. Healthcare professionals cared for me. Educators were adapting because they knew how much I had to miss for like whatever. I was surrounded by care. So I know what it means. And I, I am the embodiment of what is possible when you genuinely care for someone. And I hold that with me every single day as my compass, as my purpose, as my accountability to show up as caring and hopefully even more than the way that I was cared for because I'm in a place in my life where I have access to privileges and resources, institutions and power that we can shape towards centering in care, centering in belonging, equity, justice. And that's, that's what moves me. That's what keeps me going. When people are like, man, Ruben, you, you have too much energy and all that kind of like, I'm like, yeah, bro. Cause I was mostly medicated, knocked out and sleeping my entire childhood. I have slept for a lifetime. It's time to, it's time to make some trouble. I'm trying to make some shit happen because I don't know when my last day is going to be. And I just want to make sure that I'm honoring the promises that I made. You know, when we're little, we're like, I don't know, we're little. So I was like, man, if I wake up, I promise I'm going to be more like, you know, Goku or Batman or like whatever. Like I would always say, like, I'm going to contribute in those meaningful ways. So I made a lot of promises every time that I was asking for me to wake up the next day or like, you know, to wake up after the asthma attack to make up for that because ancestors, universe, gods um, made it happen for me to be alive today. And I have to make up for that, which goes to your point of like, who would be in my altar? Oh, my God. I, I would put um, the the ancestors and the living women who have shaped me every single every single femtor that I have had um, has been uh, a woman. That's why I hardly say mentor, because in my trajectory, it's been more women who have been there for me. It has been more women who have shaped me. It has been more women who have taken care of me. It has been more women who have held me accountable to be healthier and better than the models of men that I had around me. There are men. There are very few men who I would lift as a mentor and as a role model right? I can probably count it in one hand. I don't, I, I, I have way too many women to count. That's what I mean by like, the ratio is just different. So femtors would be there. Uh, Bell Hooks is somebody who changed my life and continues to change my life. Every time that I go to the most challenging moments like uh, death uh, and love and uh, that spectrum, there's something that Bell either said or wrote or performed that I can go to to hold me in those moments. Um, and uh, I love poetry because I grew up with a poet. So I have a lot of, of poetry around me all the time because uh, 
I don't know if it happens to you, but sometimes I'm feeling so much and I can't communicate it. So I need to find someone else who has communicated for me so that I can share with someone, this is what I'm feeling. This is the closest thing that I have to share with you what's coming up for me in this moment. So I, I give, I, I would have a lot of artists in that, uh, in that space uh, in gratitude and also inspired by, by, their, by their gifts and abilities. It's awesome. Once again, I'm always like, I love listening to you speak and um, <clears throat> I've been learning a lot. But I guess for me, my next question is, um, what are the most helpful resources that have helped you along the way? Yeah, great question. I think it goes in, in that in that uh, in that theme of like femtor. So I think this is some this is this is something that I'm very vocal about, and that's why you know my career is is what it is. But there was always there was always someone and or a program there for me. I am like the I swear if 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 uh, if there was a I don't know, like a banner or like a commercial uh, for the success of like government programs. I, I would be that kid, right? Because I came into the U.S. and I was in the, in the program, which sadly doesn't exist anymore. At least I don't think so. But I I started my 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 education in the U.S. fifty percent Spanish, fifty percent English, um, because I had to transition from coming from Mexico y entrar a Estados Unidos, and I didn't really speak English like that. So I needed to have a bridge um, into what schooling meant. So shout out to that program that existed, right? And then from there, I went to the gifted program or whatever, because I was really advanced in my math and science, because in Mexico, it's a faster pace of math and science than the US, right? So that there was that program. And then I did band that strengthened my lungs because I was asthmatic, you know, I was, I was, I was asked to play the flute, which is the wind that, that it's the wind instrument that requires the most wind to play. So I had to strengthen my muscles in a way that was pleasurable for me. So I, I played the flute and I was in band for multiple years. And then I went into Mesa and then from Mesa, I went into Avid. And then from Avid, I went into EOP in Berkeley in college from EOP, well, Summer Bridge and then EOP. And then I went to the McNair Scholars Program. Uh, and then I graduated. So literally since I came into this country, there has been a program there that I was getting um, from one person to the next. I was just getting handed off. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. It was just people who trusted the next person to like bring me in and continue. And I was a troublemaker. So I needed to, I needed that kind of structure, if you will. I needed, I needed for my anger and I needed for my joy to be seen as asset and gifts, right? I was always mad because of what was going on in my mom's immigration process. I was always mad by the severe poverty that existed. I was always mad that growing up, my normal was to go to the border, ask multiple people that were on the fence if they needed to for me to give something to their family on the other side of the fence because they put chicken wire on the fence and do that for them. And then on the other side over here, Every day I was seeing all of the problems in the world that made no sense. So I was always, I was kind of like the Hulk, right? Talking about the ghetto nerd. My secret was that I was always mad. I was always pissed of my existence, but I was always really hopeful because I was alive and because I was keeping promises of saying, if I'm going to be alive, it has to be to make meaningful contributions to address those little problems everywhere that I could. I was always that kid that I was getting in trouble because I would share my lunch money or I would give my, my lunch away. Or like when we were traveling, I was always assessing which of my classmates looked like they were hungry because they didn't have breakfast at home. So I was always sneaking food or fruits or stuff to, to make sure that I was giving to my friends because I knew that all of us had the same conditions. I loved hosting people. Whenever we would study, it was always at my spot because I knew that there was a little bit more there than whenever my friends were coming from for whatever the reasons that may be. We didn't have a lot, but we had, you know, something that we could split and share across us. So I think all of those programs came about. And then more recently, y'all, I cannot say this enough, the healing justice community, the disability justice community, the transformative justice community are my, my homes right now. 
at some point I, I, I met the, the cap of my growth at Berkeley and my values and my politics no longer were aligned with the way that that institution and the institutions of higher ed are right now. I had to, I had to get out of it. I had to go and learn about generative somatics. I had to go and study emergent strategies. I had to go and study abolition. I had to go and, and be in deep study and be in deep community relationships in those spaces. And then I learned that in those spaces, hardly anyone from higher ed is involved in those spaces. So I took it upon myself to bring those readings, bring that language, bring those invitations to the higher ed world and ask my teams to read emergent strategies and read the politics of trauma and read like abolitionist materials and have conversations about how does this apply to our higher ed work? How are we contributing to moving in the direction of those possibilities? So those will probably be the most meaningful resources and experiences that have shaped me and continue to shape me to this day. So thinking about those programs um, and also thinking about this idea of care infrastructure, what, if any, re uh, responsibility do you see the UC system, other university systems and networks, higher education, like providing for those basic needs um, and like, yeah, just kind of improving that service delivery. Like what would have made those programs that you experienced in your life more seamless? Um, I don't know if, if that's clear, but I'm just really in interested in your, your perspective on that. Say that one more time. So I'm thinking about infrastructure. I'm thinking about those programs that were of value to you in your life. And I'm thinking about, um, you know, what if any responsibility does the UC system have to create this care infrastructure that benefits maybe more than just students? Um, and I'm thinking about the hospital systems, right? And like these new metrics that you're talking about with, with health and well-being. Like, I'm just like wanting to push on that radical imagination edge. Like, I like to think about basic income. I'm like, could the UC kind of deliver some kind of program here that might already be happening? There's a lot of amazing work that I've that I've heard, um, kind of taking off at like UC Irvine and other other locations. But I'm offering you a salad. I'm like, pick what's most interesting to you. <gasps> yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that question actually. So I think um, let me let me let me answer it in this way. Um, oftentimes, I'm I'm in spaces with leadership level folks, right? The executive leaders, the chancellors, the chancellors' cabinet of these institutions. And, and when we show up to have those conversations and we start having conversations about basic needs, here's the data, here's what we're trying to accomplish, this is why we're trying to accomplish it in this way, this is the way that we can share the, the roles and responsibility of moving in that direction, and this is how it connects to literally all of the metrics of success of higher education. Let's play together, let's have fun with this, let's figure out some stuff, uh, let, let's, let's, let's have uh, a commitment to having the conversations that are needed to make that happen, right? The majority of time when we get pushback, as in we get no energy or someone is trying to uh, share a different opinion, be a dissenting voice or what have you, and we hear and we listen, my response in those moments is not to activate uh, my, um, my fight, flight, or freeze response. I get very curious because I want to understand what their lived experiences have been. So I take a moment to then ask the room question for you all. How many of you all needed financial aid for your college trajectory? And then they raise their hands or whatever. How many of you all ever experienced or knew someone in your inner circle that experienced housing instability or housing challenges? And then the exercise happens. How many of you all experienced food challenges? Hands. What about health and medical challenges? You know, hands or what have you. Now, if you all, if you all stay with me, how many of you all in your childhood, or let's just say from your K through 12, experience poverty or socioeconomic challenges, housing challenges, food challenges. 
what I've done now is normed in that space that what we are talking about is not just external to their experiences, is directly tied with their experiences. And sometimes that person who was the dissenting voice or was coming at us with antagonistic energy is now held accountable by the fact that what we're trying to do is presently in the room with the people that they have some kind of connection and relationship with after our conversation. When I leave that conversation, I don't know if they'd be like, man, that guy was ridiculous. That made no sense. What a waste of time. Let's move on to the next agenda item. Sure. I'm sure that has happened probably more than once. But when you do that, it doesn't matter who did that. Whoever leaves that room, now there is some disclosure and some transparency over the basic needs experiences of that leadership room. And sometimes that leadership room had no idea about those lived experiences across each other. It'll be the first time that they probably had a conversation about those specific areas. They all know that they're brilliant. They all know that they're powerful leaders. They all know that they earn the roles in their own unique ways. That's a different podcast conversation. But it happened. What they don't usually know is that. So what that now does, now the imagination, now the relationship is different because now we're having a conversation of how they're going to do justice for themselves, for their journeys, and for other people who are experiencing those struggles. Because after I do that exercise, then I ask them, I ask them if they believe that harm and trauma and injustice are rite of passages. They have to answer if they believe that the harm and the trauma and the injustice that they experience is supposed to be a rite of passage to the college experience. And they have to participate. Because then I've done two things. One, I've created awareness in the space of who has lived these things that we're trying to improve and change and move in a better direction and care for. And two, I've, I've assessed how many of them believe that that should continue because that's a very different conversation now. Now I know like if it's the CFO that says, no, yeah, it's a rite of passage. I think it's a good thing that students need to struggle. That's the money of the university. Your CFO is actively saying that now. That's a very different politic and strategy that we need to intervene because that means that the person that is selecting where the resources are and how to get them there, that is informing every single resource allocation on the campus is saying that injustice, challenges, harm should be part of the experience. And now them as a leadership group have to have that conversation. Hey, actually, that's not okay. We're not going to be that kind of leadership group here. There's no way that we can have people that believe that our students need to experience poverty, hunger, and homelessness. So that's the intervention there. And I would want more of us to do that kind of intervention, to norm those things, to hold people generatively accountable, and to then ask, well, if we have these experiences and we don't believe that these are a rite of passage, then we need to come together and move towards those directions. And we can move at a certain pace of progress and wellness But we cannot continue the status quo because the status quo is that harmful, unjust design. So as a follow up, I would like to ask, like, what is your relationship to decolonization and how does it inform the way that you create relational spaces? Because that's what it sounds like you're doing is you're kind of reclaiming something that could be very transactional. And you're kind of creating a container of accountability and saying, oh, we are connected to each other. All of these things that we're talking about are connected to each other. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that that's huge for me. Uh, I think the conversations of transformative justice, abolition, decolonizing, um, land back, you know, all of these different, all of these different 
uh, imaginations and spaces are finding their own language and reasoning to, to create the most abundantly nutrient soil where we can plant and harvest that direction, right? And I welcome all of those conversations because to me, you need to speak all of them, right? In some spaces, you need to speak the language of abolition. In some spaces, is decolonization. In some spaces, is land back. In some spaces, is transformative justice. I, I, I like to believe of all of those. I love music, y'all. Um, because as I shared with you, I grew up in band and just, I grew up in a very musical household. I don't think there was ever a day where music is not played where, where, where I grew up, uh, in our family. So I think about us all as a symphony and each section has their specific instrument that adds so much beauty and, and texture and, and power to the, to the symphony concerto, if you will. And we need all of those to be practicing in their areas to get better and better at their specific section as much as we need to practice as a symphony together. So when it comes to the upcoming concert that we're ready to go to play the most beautiful music together. And I think there are moments, fractal moments to macro moments where that symphony is called upon. And it could be localized in terms of a uh, law policy or budget decision that needs to be made. And that's a moment where all of these movements need to come together to make sure that the resources go where they need to go. As much as the macro movements like midterm elections that are coming up. And when the midterm elections come up, we're either gonna leave more Republican, more Democrat or about the same, regardless it's a hot ass mess. So how are we making sure that we are minimizing the harm and the violence through midterm elections by that symphony coming together? And that's not just to say in electoral politics, right? Because I think also at the local level, our relationships are important. I think that is something that that I, I, I constantly lift. It, it's not about picking and choosing. It's about making sure that our symphony is ready for all of the times that we need to be ready for those moments because those are the pivotal moments where major decisions are made, but every single day is a fractal contribution to moving in that direction. Our daily experience, our daily decisions, our daily relationships. That brings us back to that quote, kind of where we started. Um, it means bringing my values into my daily decision-making. Each day should be lived on purpose. I also wanted to just ask, um, we, I know we're heading towards the closing, <laughs> and I guess I just had like one other question, um, you know, through your experience working at UC Berkeley, was there a moment that you were proud of or like a moment that, you know, made you very happy of like the work that you've been doing there? Oh, man, I, I, I've had so many, y'all. Uh, I think that's that's a reason why why I've been there since since 2007. Um, I, I can't say enough about how much I am in awe, how much I am humbled and how much in love I am with our chosen family, um, that, that I get to wake up and, and share quality time with them every day. Just they, they are, they are everything to me. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's those relationships of folks that, that make um, everything have so much more meaning and so many more possibilities be realized. So that's one. I think when it comes to um, experiences that we've had, ch changing the policy so we can serve more students for EOP was monumental. I, I still remember the closing of that event. It was one of the few moments that I could just got completely overwhelmed and I started crying. Uh, in front of everybody. And I'm not a crier, like at all. I'm not a crier, but I was just so overwhelmed. That's something that we had dreamt about and bringing people together. I love bringing people together. I mean, we had all 10 universities there. No one had ever met each other and they all came together. And the first time together, they changed a massive policy of eligibility. I was super overwhelmed. Uh, launching our undocumented student program. I cried uh, as well, like with my mom, because that was my way of saying, mom, like, 
this is for you. You know, like my contribution to this is because of our undocumented journey and because of the undocumented communities that we come from. And now there's an undocumented student program so that those families and students have a place where they can be taken care of and supported. Uh, and then our, our basic needs efforts. I mean, we now have basic needs spaces at, in all public colleges in California, right? Like every single one of those efforts contributed to making better the next one and so on and so forth. So uh, there's a lot to celebrate uh, and there's even more ahead. I, I, I really genuinely believe this, like our healthiest and our best times are ahead. I'm so inspired y'all by like the baseline radicalness of like Gen Z, like these folks that are coming up, I'm like, it's incredible. They're like, what the fuck is gender? Why are we wasting our time with these politics? Like, yes, we're going to treat the environment as a priority. We belong to her and she is taking care of us. Like they're coming so radicalized and it's normative for them that they're taking us to that world that, that we've been dreaming for generations. And, and it's just a matter of letting current older generations transition into ancestral planes so that we can finally have the world that we've been deserving this entire time. Wow, thank you so much for sharing. I felt myself tearing up too, listening to all those moments. And I'm just like, damn, I'm super happy for all the work you've been doing. And thank you so much for everything. So I wanted to share something um something that's part of my self-reflection practice is working with the tarot um and i actually pulled three cards while we were chatting and the first one that i got was the rejoicer this is the the woman of cups so finding that joy and that yeah that deep sense of like love and connection to to purpose by being part of this grand design of life fortune which good things coming, abundance, and achiever, man of worlds. And just recognizing like every day does matter. And in terms of building the world that we all know we deserve and really centering that joy. That's what I'm leaving this conversation with is so much joy, so much gratitude and appreciation. Thanks y'all for listening. This was our first episode of the Regeneration Nation podcast. Thank you to Ruben. Thank you to Elvia. Um, have a blessed day. It's also a full moon today. So take that time, go outside, observe, be present. Much love y'all.